Hello, Natalia. Welcome to the Modern Careers Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Nicole. I was really excited about Modern Modern Careers uh, Podcast, so I'm happy today. Wonderful. Well, it's so great to have you. Um, And I always like to start my podcast off with a cheer. So cheer for you. Thank you very much for for coming on. And the second um, reason why I want to cheers you is I did some homework. (laughs) <laughs> and um I think it's really important I, I'd like to share with my guests um and the listeners uh, about how great of uh, the people and how lucky we are to to have our guests on and, and guests like you so I wanted to to do some homework and see what people say about you um because it's it's amazing and i think all of our listeners really need to hear that so you can sit back and relax and enjoy your coffee and i'm going to let our listeners know a little bit uh, about natalia um okay here we go natalia is a gracious manager who balances both business and professional standards to the next level she excels at developing relationships with both institutions and individuals natalia is excellent at management of educational programs. She is detail-oriented, highly motivated, and and an experienced professional and will be an asset to any organization. I would like to highlight Natalia as one of the best professionals I've worked with and reported to. She's a hardworking, success-driven leader who inspires her colleagues with her clear vision and firm planning towards reaching their business goals. And I can go on all day. (laughs) Natalia is an intelligent business executive. Her command of language is amazing. She speaks six international languages. Natalia is a true internationalist, having traveled the world all over, mostly on business. In conversation, she utilizes the vast array of experience in her travels to articulate multiple perspectives. So just a little bit for all of our listeners about this really exciting guest we have on today. It's an absolute honor and and pleasure. And a little bit more about uh, Natalia. Uh, She has a doctorate of education from the University of British Columbia. She has over 16 years of experience in business development, career development, management, and is currently the program manager of health sciences and environment co-op at Simon Fraser University. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And and thank you, I guess, everyone who says that about me. I'll just uh, correct that a little bit, a little bit. I do have a doctorate uh, from Slovakia, Doctor of Philosophy. um, And I am almost at the defense stage of my doctoral degree at the University of British Columbia, where I study uh, plurilingualism and how does the knowledge of multiple languages as human beings towards uh, more acceptance and openness. And I study this through the lens of transformative learning. So uh, that's that's... just, yeah, not to toot my horn yet with the doctorate (laughs) from the UBC, but I do have one from Comenius University in Bratislava. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you so much um, for for letting me know that because not only UBC, but you have um, quite an international experience, which leads me into my first question that I'm so excited about. Can you tell us a little bit about your career journey and how you landed at where you're at and maybe even talk about the studies you're you're doing right now? I'd love to learn more. Um, so I um, grew up in socialist Czechoslovakia, not to go too deep into the history, but just to show that I was always very excited about, uh, you know, exploring the borders of socialist countries a little bit more and, and getting out there one day. Hence my motivation to learn languages as well, which my grandfather used to tell me as many languages, you know, as many times you are a human being. And so... I listened and I applied myself and Marlon Dietrich was somebody who really, who he really admired at the time. And so I learned whatever I have access to. And often it was, you know, going to the libraries, pulling out old dictionaries, because in those times we didn't really have, we weren't allowed to learn languages other than Russian and German. 
So, wow. you know, it, it needed some, some sort of discoveries as well uh, on that journey. But hence, it was a little bit of a detective work, exciting. And so I enjoyed that. And I grew up in a very happy, loving family um, of educators. So my father taught me loving the nature. So even in my studies, I combined two majors, biology and English language and literature. And so with that, um, through opportunities I got, um, uh, through interpreting, translating, I got to work with the world of business as well, human resources specifically, and science. So that made me a little bit more versatile and maybe a little bit different. So I didn't go into that one niche, but I really enjoyed all three, business, science, and yeah. languages. Wow. And so um, just not to go too, too deep, in 2005, I immigrated to Canada and as a fresh immigrant walking down the campuses of the universities, I had a dream that one day I work, I will work at UBC and potentially SFU. And I did fulfill those dreams, but my journey went through recruitment. I realized at the time when I immigrated, the most need, the market uh, called for recruiters. There was not enough recruiters. So initially I started using my experience from Slovakia, going into financial recruitment field as an executive recruiter. Then I built more um, connection uh, with corporations. Uh, then through that, I got into international student recruitment and started working for an Australian company, Navitas, at Fraser International College, which was located at Simon Fraser University. Okay. And this is where I got that excitement of uh, traveling the world because I went to Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Russia, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, Thailand, South Korea, all as a business trip representing the college. And my last two employment, that was with um, the University of British Columbia um, at Quantum Matter Institute, where I developed program for graduate students of chemistry, physics, engineering predominantly, and built some equity, diversity, and inclusion programs as well for undergraduate students and um, got to work with all the stakeholders, whether it's um, faculty, students, and also business communities. And now I am at Simon Fraser University, leading science, environment, and health sciences called programs, wow. working with approximately 7,000 students, potentially. That is an incredible journey. I'm just sitting here the whole time saying, wow, and the traveling and coming to Canada and fulfilling your dream of UBC and Simon uh, Fraser. That's a that's an incredible journey and that's an incredible, incredible story. And just hearing how you're able to apply your own teachings, your own skill sets to these students and allowing them to evolve and, and potentially um, become the best the best of themselves and the best of the best to prepare them for their co-ops and, and their dreams, um, which is really Indeed. exciting. So speaking of students, <laughs> this leads me into my next question. Um, I would love your perspective on, you know, there's a lot out now about AI and I would love your perspective on how you foresee the nature of career paths changing for these students. Um, in the next decade or so with all these advancements in technology? Oh, indeed, Nicole, there's so much happening. And the year 2024 specifically was a mark that actually changes one whole era. Um, I will use the words of Pierre Slini, an expert from UK who actually uh, started in 2023 a company that uh, is helping other companies uh, embrace AI and implement it into their practices so that they don't stay behind. It's called right. implement AI. And he really divided the era, uh, the, the three eras that we lived in at human first era, which 
is marked as finishing right now because no longer the cognitive skills of humans uh, determine where we are going. But we entered in 2024 actually into the AI assisted era. And we see this with ChatGPT. Uh, businesses and individuals using chat DP, uh, GPT to improve their documents. Yeah. Um, some of them even using it to fully formulate their documents. So it's in one way super exciting that we have access to this technology. On the other hand, there's a little bit of uncertainty and that uncertainty will be growing as AI will be progressing because right now, and for the next maybe only five years, maybe a decade, we will see how fast it will go. But AI will be able to, to do certain tasks of a job description, not full jobs yet. But we will then move in maybe 10 years even, who knows? I am very optimistic or seeing this as progressing very fast. Maybe it will take a little more to AI first where the AI will overtake all the cognitive skills that can be programmed, that are somewhat repetitive, that can be coded. And so we will see robots in warehouses, robots in households, households that can afford them to do simple jobs. Yeah. But there's still hope in the form of, I believe, uh, for humans and how we can robot proof our education and how we can robot proof our careers in terms of that our emotional intelligence will be valued so much more and those complex decision making skills and the strategies that cannot be deprogrammed decoded and implemented that way but those that require some unpredictable uh, thinking some shifts in minds some experience, sensoric experience, et cetera. So there is that hope that we, um, you know, in the field of coaching, in the field of mentoring, in yeah. the field of management of people in an unpredictable way, uh, paying attention to their feelings, paying attention to um, yeah. uh, navigating their careers, we will still be necessary. We will still be useful. I agree. And that's very insightful. I think for all of our listeners, I mean, just take a moment and pause uh, to hear what Natalia just had to say, because, um, you know, I'm on the tech side of things and, and working in, in on the AI side. And you're absolutely right. That's, that's where it's heading. And I think, you know, as far as speaking of students and speaking of preparing them, I think one of the big things to acknowledge based on what you said is, you know, that empathy component, the critical thinking um, and, and being, you know, we still have those tool sets where these machines don't have that. So that's how um, we can complement these tools to let them kind of do the low hanging fruit. But then we have that human element of um, that feeling and, and the critical thinking, which really leads me to um, my next question, <laughs> which is, and, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what challenges and, and opportunities do you anticipate to um, professionals due to these changes? So um, some challenges will be indeed that, as I already mentioned, all the repetitive, predictable yeah. pieces of work, those um, may be eliminated. So those jobs may become redundant and, and they will inevitably. But the excitement of that is that humans will have opportunities to hone their critical thinking. It will be a must where IQ will become a task. Um, and that is a threat even for a legal profession, for example, for the profession of paralegals, for the legal system, uh, for anything repetitive but not for our plumbers, for example, because that is that uh, yeah. sensory uh, uh, skills, that is that thinking on the job where problem solving is so important that it's really not easy to decipher and predict exactly what can be wrong with a machine, with a system, etc. So 
excitement about having those mundane, boring, repetitive tasks being overtaken by AI and threat about pushing ourselves harder because, yeah. you know, we were talking about soft skills. Um, I mean, we as humankind, that they are called soft skills. But many people said, my colleagues in career development, they should actually not be called soft. Yeah. Because they should not be taken lightly because they are so so hard to build, um, so hard to develop. So uh, we will have to pay more attention there. Everything teachable, everything fact-based, um, the machines will be faster at sorting that out than we are as humans. So hence, really inevitably, AI will be really beneficial there. And so we will have to shift how we're preparing students. More critical thinking, more emotional intelligence, more paying attention to human feelings, more spending time together. And this is where it's actually contradictory because AI is aiming even to creating companions for lonely people, elderly people, etc. But where it goes to more complexity beyond healthcare, beyond giving pills that can be timed and, and probably served by robots in the future. Beyond that, the human connection, the complex human connection, I think will become precious. I think so too. I, I absolutely couldn't agree more. I, um, I'm just thinking, you know, it's, it is kind of, it, it's funny because like you're saying it, the, these, in, in uh, we're about to be digital David soon, but these, you know, digital humans, um, you're able to go and, and have conversations with them. And in the case you said, you know, maybe if you're a senior and you're lonely, but from a co-op perspective and, and what I've seen in the benefits is that it's a safe place to build that confidence and practice and make mistakes to go have that human interaction. So can we have them in here interacting um, to reduce anxiety levels, to go have that human experience. Um, because a lot of what we, we're seeing, and I would love your perspective on it. I was reading an article, it was a couple weeks now back, but I guess 87, it said that 87% of um, the new generation has menu ordering anxiety. So when they go into a restaurant, they're feeling anxious. So the question, you know, based on what we're saying that came to my mind is, oh my goodness, how can we create these safe places for them to feel comfortable and communicate and, and uh, be able to order off the menu and, and, and how can we prepare them for those things? What's your perspective on that? It's indeed so true. And I was talking to a colleague of mine who said that her daughter went with her shopping and then um, she was busy with some other things and she said, I'm going to arrange this. Why don't you go and buy this thing that you need? And yeah. the daughter remained silent and uncomfortable. But uh, how will I pay? And well, here's my credit card. Use my credit card. Just arrange it yourself. And it was not easy for the daughter. And it, it took her embarrassment. I think the only way is to really allowing children to be in those for them uncomfortable situations. Because if I can think of my own childhood, it wasn't super comfortable for me either, oh. right? But we got exposed. We were often left for ourselves to resolve these situations. I was one of the children who grew up outside, like go outside, come back for dinner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, you had to figure it out somehow. You had to communicate with people. And there were conflicts to resolve with others even just people who didn't like what we were doing as children outside, yelling at us or whatever. Yeah. That was a little conflict that we had to resolve, which right. nowadays these children are protected from everything. They're driven to an activity. They're um, followed through. And even the, the, the parents are there just in case something would happen yes. at the activity and then collect it to go home. So... <laughs> limited interaction indeed i know i i absolutely had the, the same upbringing like come back in when the street lights are on and you know fend for yourself sort of thing and it's funny you say that because it 
<laughs> I don't know if I should admit this or not, but I told my husband last week that I, I have a younger daughter and I was like, do you think we can put like an Apple air tag on her so we, <laughs> so we can track her? <laughs> yes, Doesn't that yes. sound like a new generation mom where they want to track their child? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to be one of those parents that, uh, you know, you're, you're there, but you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that's how we learn from anything is how do we become uncomfortable? How do we make mistakes and get up and learn? And that's what really gets us to um, successful moments in our own careers and our own journey is through failing. Because if we didn't fail, then we would never have, um, you know, the opportunities or the gratefulness that we have Mm -hmm. to get to these places. So I think you bring up a really, really important point. So I'm happy you did bring that up. Thank you. Um, If I may just elaborate a little bit. So I have a daughter who's a figure skater, just because you mentioned failing. Yeah, I am so grateful for her actually choosing this sport, because it's a lot of failing. I did not even realize how difficult this sport is, because not only uh, spatial imagination, you are never there alone as a figure skater. There's many other children that are practicing and just not to crash one into another to avoid yeah. that situation to navigate that to be able to do what the coaches want right there uh, requires quite complex um, brain activity so to understand decipher do immediately because if you don't there's quite loud uh, dissatisfaction expressed from yeah. the coaches so this this um mm, opportunity to fail correct and deal with also strict personalities I think is what we should give our children this opportunity because without that they are on to soft landing and I do believe that a lot of depression anxiety everything comes yeah. from not being exposed to that right right yeah, no, that's such a good, and I never thought about that with skating, but that is so true because if mm-hmm. they fall or they trip and that type of pressure, so that's, that's very interesting. And, and I love that you bring that up because like I said, being a new mom, it's important to think about, um, you know, the upbringing and, and how you want them to, you know, funnily enough, even when they're small and they fall, it's like, well, they have to learn. It's the same thing. If, you know, yes. if they bump their head then, you know, they're going to learn not to, to be a little bit more careful next time. So it's, a, it's, it's funny, it's from an infant all the, all the way up, how those, those root lessons really, really apply. That's very insightful. Thank you. I, I, this is the first time I've had this type of conversation about uh, the importance of failing and learning and growing and developing. So I really appreciate that you're bringing up these points. I think our listeners are really going to appreciate it as well. Um, which leads me to, this is, I call this my fun part of the podcast. I was telling one of my guests this week, my previous background, I was in banking for 10 years and um, they used to call me, I was in the, the training division and they'd call me fun Nicole. So I thought I'd bring that back to, <laughs> to the podcast. I'm exciting. I'm excited. Yeah. So um, okay, so the first part of this fun episode is, um, do, you, do you happen to have a pen and paper by chance handy? I have a paper. Yes, I have a pen as well. Okay, sure. perfect. Yes. Okay, so you can choose two, but one or two. Um, I want you to write down on the piece of paper one reason or two uh, why you think a student might not get chosen for an interview. All right. All right. Okay. So hold it up. Let's see what you have to say. Oh, it's such bad handwriting. Oh, I do too, but that's okay. okay. So just on a piece of paper, can you see it? One I says ap- application and the other one says connection. Right. And oh. what I meant by it is the quality of application documents and the second one, once they would get to that stage to, to introduce themselves, inability to make a connection, or even if they are not at the interview yet, inability to make a connection, to spark an interest somehow in a recruiter or a hiring manager. 
Okay. Okay. So if they're about to get an interview, maybe that's at a networking event where they're making that connection or is it even making a connection? If we go a little bit deeper, could it be making connection on their actual resume where they personalize exactly. the resume yes. to that job where the, the reader is like, wow, right. Right. Thoughtful. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I, 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 I highly agree with that. I chose the same thing. Actually. I said personalization. Yeah. Um, oh. I need glasses yeah. to see that. Yeah, and, and I think now speaking of 2024 and how things have evolved is I think we are living in a world now of personalization. It's not where you can have Absolutely. the same cover letter for you know applying no. for a multitude, multitude of jobs or similarly um, your resume. And one thing I have seen on the AI side is they're using tools now to do keyword analysis. Absolutely, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's good for the listeners to know to make sure you're putting in the thoughtfulness and the effort and the personalization uh, to to be able to stand out because it is a competitive world. Okay, great. Absolutely. So my second question to you. Okay. Is, so the student, so they've passed and they're in the interview now. And what is one reason why you think um, they might not actually get the job from whatever they've done in the interview? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it is similar in a way that connection, there's there's a first minute or two when you are able to make a connection or you are not able to make a connection. And it goes from first feeling the energy of that applicant. Is there dynamicism in them? Is there passion? Is there interest in that person? Are they listening? Are, are they connecting? Are they showing the signs that they're excited about this opportunity? If they fail to show that, it's a big minus. There's always, you know, of course, we are all people. So as hiring managers, they give a chance to per a person thinking, okay, it might be nervousness. It, it might be feeling uncomfortable. Uh, so then... Of course, there has to be the skill set required for the job that the candidate has to be able to communicate throughout what we call star statements. So description of the situation where they found themselves in a particular job, a task that they were doing, and then um, actions they took to resolve that situation and uh, result that yeah. they presented. So um, if they are able to communicate this way and go through behavioral questions that are checking the behaviors in certain situations of the students or candidates in general for the job, then the chances are that the hiring managers are seeing, okay, this is a structured person. They can um, decipher the problem uh, compartmentalized uh, this problem into uh, various aspects of it and communicate the results. So their thinking is clear and this is what we need normally in our workplaces. And um, so there's a bigger chance uh, that that candidate will be successful. And also important, not only are they a fit in terms of a personality, as an individual, but are they a fit in terms of a team that they might be working with? So that's also a very important uh, decision part for a hiring manager. I think that, I mean, you just share some golden insights for all of our listeners. And I think what's interesting and really coming together from our conversation is when we talk about AI and, and technology moving quicker and, and the points that you brought up earlier is the importance of communication, critical thinking, um, you know, soft skills or hard skills. When you think about that, it, it is really portraying those skills in the interview because you, you know, those tasks might become performed more by an AI uh, machine learning where you're really wanting to differentiate yourself during the interview and showing that you have those critical thinking competencies, the communication and those sorts of skill sets. So it's kind of all coming together now. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we're going to bring in digital AI, David, speaking of AI, and we're going to ask him to see if he thinks that he agrees with us. What do you think? 
<laughs> well, I am very interested what uh, David David is going to say. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm going to get him up in the background here. We'll see if he's had his coffee yet. Uh, so bear with me. In the meantime, I'll take a chance to. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. So I am setting up our simulation for us, Natalia, and we're going to go in and we're going to see if AI agrees with us. Let's see. <laughs> and our many years of experience that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, let's make David, let's say cheeky today. Oh, okay. We're up for a challenge. We're up for a challenge. Hopefully he comes to our meeting. <laughs> we'll we'll see if he's still having his lunch. <laughs> mm, this is this is really exciting, Nicole. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's it's really aligned with the conversation we we're having of how can we. Wow. Hey there, I'm David, your friendly neighborhood career advisor. What brings you to my humble corner of the internet today? Hi, David. I'm uh, here with Natalia, and we're actually doing a podcast right now uh, together. And we're talking about, um, you know, technology and AI and all of um, those types of topics. And one thing we wanted to bring you into the conversation, um, or one reason why we want to bring you in the conversation is we landed on the topic of, you know, why, why don't students get the interview? So um, we're wondering, we have our perspectives, but we're wondering if you could tell us your perspective before we share our perspectives with you. Oh, a podcast? Fancy. All right, why don't students get the interview, you ask? Well, let's dive into that, shall we? But first, why do you think students might struggle to land those elusive interviews? Well, we were hoping you could tell us first. You mind maybe telling us one reason why you think, and then uh, myself and Natalia will will let you know our insights. Oh, playing hard to get, are we? All right, I'll start. One common reason is focusing on quantity over quality in applications. Now, what do you two think? Natalia, I'll let you go first. Okay, I agree with you, David. There are many of those students who just simply have one resume, throw it out there to different jobs and see uh, what will land, so to speak, or what will, what will stick. And that's totally not a good strategy. In nowadays world, we have to tailor every single application to a particular job opportunity so that we have a chance to stand out and actually even do proper research of the company to um, kind of gauge what could really be interesting in ourselves and yet remain genuine in communicating that. That's a solid point, Natalia. Tailoring those applications can indeed make a difference. So, how do you approach tailoring your applications to specific job opportunities? So in that case, I would read the job description. I would make sure that I understand it. I would uh, think about myself, what do I have to hit every of those bullet points that are stated in the job description so that I can demonstrate through problem, action, result, thinking, how I am a fit for that particular job. Sounds like you've got a clear strategy in mind. How do you ensure that your application stands out among the sea of competitors who might be doing the same thing? Well, David, um, one other thing that we've been talking about on the podcast is we, we've been talking about, so the, the student will, let's say they get the job and during the interview, something goes away. Um, so Natalia and I have been talking about, well, what can go wrong during the interview that might cost them from, from not getting the job? Can you, can you share your insights or maybe just pick one thing of why you think the candidate might not get the job during the interview? Like what mistakes are they making? All right, then let's unravel the mysteries of interview mishaps. One common mistake is failing to showcase enthusiasm and passion for the role. 
How do you think candidates can effectively convey their enthusiasm during interviews? Well, I think Natalia actually brought up some good points. You mind sharing that with David? Well, um, I was saying that um, the application is not, uh, sorry, are we in the interview already? Just to clarify. Okay, yes, if we're in the interview already, uh, not showing the dynamicism and not showing the passion, not able to connect within that one minute, the first minute of the interview. Um, and afterwards, if this failed, and the research is not demonstrated, uh, the questions for the company, uh, then um, it might happen that, uh, you know, the, the participants still have an opportunity to show uh, their skill set uh, in answering the questions, which should be in the format problem, action, results. So describing what they were doing in a particular situation, how they resolved the problem, and what was the final result that aligns with what the company wants in that particular role. It seems like you're diving deep into the details of interview performance. How do you personally ensure that you convey your passion and make that strong positive impression in the crucial first minute of an interview? I myself uh, would uh, sincerely and openly state that I am excited about this opportunity I have with you. As I expressed in my application, this role aligns very well with my experience, with my passion, and with my career goals for the future, for particular reasons uh, that would, um, of course, match uh, the, the job that they're recruiting for. The user has provided a thorough response, detailing how they convey passion in interviews. Let's acknowledge their effort and encourage them further. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. <laughs> David, um, I know um, where we're talking about interviews, I'm hoping to change the topic uh, a little bit um, because Natalia and I are we're, we're going to be wrapping up here soon. But I have I do have a question for you. Um, we've been really talking about the impact of AI. And, you know, how it's important for humans to, you know, really continue to have critical thinking skills, communication skills, um, as we're seeing that AI might be able to take, um, you know, more of the, the mundane tasks and low hanging fruit. Do you mind giving us some um, your perspective on, uh, on that topic? Absolutely. Let's dive into the world of AI and its impact on human skills. How do you believe the rise of AI will shape the future of work and the skills that will be in demand? Well, I feel like AI is going to have the ability to take away a more of the, you know, mundane, um, repetitive tasks. Um, but then the human, so AI used as a tool, but then the human is going to be able to um, continue to play a massive role from critical thinking to communication skills uh, to relationship building. What's your perspective on that? Can you tell Natalie, Natalia and I? Indeed, AI is reshaping the work landscape. How do you think individuals can best prepare themselves to complement AI's capabilities with their unique human skills like critical thinking and relationship building? Natalia, I'll let you finish off on this one. <laughs> yeah, well, um... The individuals um, should um, hone their skills in critical thinking by uh, spending time uh, with other people, socializing more, resolving real life problems in team building, in groups, getting in insights so that they can actively think about problems at hand and become uh, more and more active this way in their lives. Use any human contact in order to prepare themselves to be more competitive in that market. Wow, that was amazing. That was my first interaction that I always wanted to have, Nicole, and was not able to have yet. 
because I was I was brought by three children into VR world just last oh. Saturday. Wow! But I, I tell you, it's nothing like this. This is what I would have wanted. And that is what they brought me into. My first VR experience was actually uh, scuba diving. And there was, it was a whale that would, so you were underwater and there was a whale and it felt like a real whale and it came up and it, wow. uh, it came right in front of me. And it was the most, you're so immersed. It was the most incredible experience, but um, believe it or not, digital David actually came from VR. So he came from, <laughs> from the VR world but is now scalable in the non-VR world. <laughs> and accessible. That's truly ama amazing experience. Yes. Yeah. It totally gives me a completely different flavor for interviewing in the future. There will be no escape for the candidates. <laughs> no, so, no. Yeah, and, yeah. And it will be up on, I, I'm not sure if you saw, but there's a transcript. So, um, when when a user is done the session, it will give a full analysis on what they said, uh, feedback on how they could be better, things like uh, how quickly they spoke. So it's doing a full analysis on on the individual in in the simulation. So it's quite incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, this uh, summarizes, and then that's kind of the the ending of our Modern Careers podcast. And I am so grateful, Natalia, that you came on. Um, I think it was a lovely conversation. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time to, to join us today. If anyone wanted to reach out to you, is LinkedIn the, the best spot if they had any questions? LinkedIn is fantastic. And uh, before we say goodbye, thank you so much, Nicole. It's been such a pleasure for me. And it was such a natural, genuine conversation. You had lots of surprise for me, actually. I totally didn't expect this. And so... And David put me on the spot there <laughs> with <laughs> critical thinking and thinking on the spot. So that was really interesting. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.